Welcome back, everyone, to U.S.-Russian relations. Uh, my apologies for the long gap in the delivery of these uh, lectures. Um, I'm going to today to step back a little bit uh, since it's been approximately three months since we um, met in uh, person in, in lecture. Um, I'm going to step back a little bit to just give you a quick review of some of the things we covered and uh, proceed forward from where we had left off back in March when we were all able to physically meet together. Um, we looked at essentially since the founding of the United States in 1776 at U.S.-Russian relations through the uh, end of the 18th century and through to the 19th century. And we were going to be in our fifth lecture looking at what occurs as the world moves into the 20th century. So let me just bring you back again to what we have covered so far, we saw some strange similarities between uh, the Russian monarchy and uh, the American Republic. Uh, both kind of were very cooperative, in particularly in their share of physical territory. Uh, we looked at the process in which Russia had disengaged itself from North America into a kind of geopolitical um, geopolitical layout uh, as it will be in the Cold War and um, as it is today. Uh, we saw that essentially American and Russian interests were often the same. Both had, um, you know, a, a slave system until uh, a little bit after the middle of the 19th century. Um, the Russians, of course, emancipate their serfs in the early 1860s. Um, uh, the Americans abolish slavery in, um, well, I guess technically um, 1862, but um, the American Civil War really has to uh, com be completed to completely free the slaves, so let's say 1865. Um, and Americans are essentially, the United States is disengaged from European or Middle Eastern issues. They are an isolationist state. The Russians in Europe, of course, are beginning to alienate the European communities of monarchies and the French Republic by their kind of adherence to a absolute monarchy in the old style, and as well, Russia's historical expansion uh, from the 1790s right up to the eve of the First World War into the Black Sea region. Um, this, of course, is of um, the most threat to the Ottoman Empire of the Turks and, of course, to the British who find themselves, as they're building the Suez Canal, um, and as well as they're prior to the building of the Suez Canal, they're using this area as a road to India. This, of course, begins to worry the Russians, as well as there is this um, rivalry between Russia and Britain in Afghanistan, known as the Great Game, quite famous for all the espionage that was um, being undertaken there. So gradually, Russia is beginning to be seen as this kind of powerful threat in Europe. Um, the Americans, in the meantime, the United States, um, attempts to maintain some form of, of neutrality and continues doing business with with Russia. And um, as I say, their um, relations are what we would say are cordial, cooperative, and, and warm. There is no sense of rivalry with the Russians until towards the end of the 19th century, and we'll see that will be about uh, primarily China. 
but blacks, the Black Sea, of course, was critical for Russian expansion. It still is critical for the Russian uh, sense of security. And of course, the Crimean Peninsula is right there in the center of it all today, as it was back then as well. Um, this kind of ability to exit from the Black Sea into the Mediterranean is key for Russia, as that was one of the few warm water ports they had at that time. So gradually, as I say, the Russians go from being the gendarmes of um, Europe to now this kind of uh, great power threat to the balance of power that the Europeans had been celebrating since the defeat of Napoleon, this relatively stable uh, situation in Europe after the Napoleonic Wars. And the only thing that is going to start upsetting it, of course, is um, Russian expansionism into the Black Sea. And of course, as the Ottoman Empire is de de declining, there are fears that Russia will enter into the vacuum. And so partly over this issue, we have one of the first um, great industrial wars, the Crimean War, uh, that is pursued by the French and British against Russia on the Crimean Peninsula. And of course, that's a war that the Russians do not forget to this uh, day. And it has much to do with uh, still the current Russian concern with security on its southern flank um, off the Black Sea and in the Crimea, and of course has everything to do with um, Putin's re-annexation of the Crimea to, Ru to Russia. So both nations uh, kind of endure these wars, uh, the Crimean War and then the American Civil War. So there is, as I say, this, this, this kind of synchronicity almost in American and Russian domestic history and as well, of course, consequently, their foreign policy. The Russians will continue expanding into uh, the Black Sea region uh, within um, a decade and a half of the Crimean War. It really did not stop Russian expansionism and it continues throughout the 19th century. And essentially, the point here is the decline again of the Ottoman Empire and this rivalry between the European powers. Now, Germany has become a nation as well as of uh, 1870, so you have an additional player. So Germany, France, Britain, and Russia are all looking at how to subdivide and annex various parts of the Ottoman Empire as it's declining throughout um, the 19th and into the 20th centuries. At home, Russia, of course, is this repressive regime, especially since the assassination of Tsar Alexander II in the 1880s. Um, a lot of Americans are sympathetic with Russian dissidents and resistors. There is a sense in the United States that the Russian government has now become incompatible with the values of American democratic republicanism. Uh, and, and so there is at first, and, and they will remain um, as well throughout this process, uh, an enormous sympathy among Americans for anti-monarchist movements and um, dissident movements inside of Imperial Russia at that period. The problem, of course, is um, after the murder of Tsar Alexander II, there is this growing um, resurgence of anti-Semitism uh, 
in Russia. Uh, there are uh, pogroms, uh, there are massacres that begin to occur, and these will continue right through into the 20th century. Um, that too begins since a lot of these uh, pogroms against uh, Russian Jews um, are partly sanctioned by the R Russian imperial government. Um, after the assassination, the Russian government now imposes all sorts of restrictions on Jews uh, as a way to uh, pacify the rest of the population. Um, it's a scapegoating um, uh, strategy, and, and to some extent it, 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 it works, uh, but it begins to alienate, certainly, um, Americans further from this kind of autocratic repressive regime that uh, Russia is beginning to take on as of um, the 1880s, as of uh, the assassination of the Tsar. There is an organized uh, Jewish American lobby in the United States that uh, begins to encourage refugee immigration into the United States uh, from Russia. Um, there is also lobbying of the American government to sanction Russia for its restrictive anti-Semitic measures. Um, in particular, one of the things that begins to also irritate Russian-American relations is the Russian um, application of various anti-Semitic measures to former Russian Jews who have taken American citizenship and returned back to Russia either to do business or uh, to see their families. Some of them find themselves conscripted into the Russian army by uh, virtue of their original Russian birth. So this further begins to irritate, um, you know, Russian-American relations. And, and it's a no problem, of course, for Americans. This was a problem they had with Britain, whether um, American uh, naturalized citizens of British origin um, who uh, had taken up American citizenship, whether Britain was going to recognize their new American passport as uh, giving them immunity from being treated as, uh, you know, British subjects. That, that was an old problem, um, and it applies to almost every nation that um, is a source of immigrants for the United States. Um, and, and, and so this, too, begins to exasperate relations between the United States and um, Russia. And, 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 and so you begin to see these kinds of factions inside of the United States uh, foreign policy community, uh, kind of pro-government uh, factions uh, who support the imperial system and the Russian government as it is, and um, reformist progressive uh, factions that uh, begin to look at the need for what Americans feel is democratic reform in autocratic um, imperial Russia. And these various factions, of course, are, are going to clash as the United States foreign policy is going to be shaped in response to things that are happening in, in Europe and overseas. And this becomes even further uh, problematic as uh, the Russian revolutionary movement and reform movement becomes progressively more violent. Um, it begins to inspire throughout Europe anarchist revolutionary movements, and, and so that further um, polarizes American foreign policy initiatives between, you know, those who support reform and those who begin to see reform in Russia as spawning uh, the, this kind of global um, anarchist movement that is targeting heads of state, kings, 
presidents, uh, prime ministers, and, and, and so forth. And some of this violence begins to pour into the United States as well, um, in particular in the labor movement. And of course, you have the Haymarket Massacre again in Chicago in the 1880s. Uh, this results with uh, this kind of emergence of um, American revolutionaries like the martyrs of Chicago who um, are all going to be put to death for alleged connections to the Haymarket riots or the Haymarket massacre. And, and I had described it in a classroom literature, but a classroom lecture, but essentially it, it, it is kind of a circulatory return um, of uh, kind of democratic values from the United States that seep into Russia are, are, are then therefore uh, radicalized in the way they're radicalized and then flow back into the United States. And so indeed, there is an international agenda for the social defense against anarchists. And so the United States, um, you know, in 1898, the United States is tending to cooperate with the Russian government and the French government and the Italian and all the European states in this kind of international crusade against the anarchists. So despite the fact that um, Russian autocracy may alienate um, American values, in the end, it becomes, um, you know, an expediency for the United States to cooperate with the Russian Empire in this fight against anarchism that is essentially seen now as a universal threat to everyone, very much the way we see international terrorism today. The other problem, of course, is a nativist anti-immigrant response as well as uh, refugees from Eastern Europe from, uh, again, the draconian measures that the Russian government is imposing begin to pour into the United States, and the United States begins to, nativist elements um, in, in the United States begin to uh, kind of look at the United States is possibly being, quote, a, a dumping ground for all sorts of undesirable um, individuals coming to uh, live in the United States, um, and especially Jews. Uh, this is, of course, you know, anti-Semitism is deeply ingrained, not only in, uh, in, in um, Russian culture, but as well in new American culture, and, and it's, it, it is universal. And, and so in s many ways, some American policymakers as well are beginning to argue that um, the reform of the autocracy in Russia is necessary for American defense from um, all these revolutionary rabble refugees uh, that are arriving in the United States. Had only the Russians had a more progressive democratic system, the United States would not have this problem. So it's further exasperating relations uh, between the United States um, and especially, again, foreign policy makers. So in, 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 in a strange way, um, the impetus for reform in Russia from American policymakers is, in a way, a, a, a kind of conservative impetus about preserving, um, you know, the racial uh, purity of the United States. It still is, despite um, huge waves of Catholic immigrants, it still is it primarily a Protestant country, um, and and now um, this mixed uh, mix of Eastern Europeans, um, non-Christian Jews, and so forth, really is beginning to trouble the United States at the end of the uh, 19th century. And um, the United States itself, in terms of the radical radicalization of American trade unions, is responding with um, military intervention at home. 
so both states, Russia and the United States, uh, at the end of the 19th century, are to some degree um, repressive, uh, especially in the United States, or certainly when it comes to uh, trade unionism. Uh, trade unionism is a felony under the Sherman Act. It's uh, considered to be um, the, um, an attempt, a conspiracy to restrict trade, the idea that workers would negotiate their working conditions or, or payments collectively with an, an, an employer is uh, just considered un-American. And, and so the American response is, as they say, a military one to suppressing large uh, mobilizations of strikers and labor union activists. At the same time, the United States under McKinley in the last years of the 1890s begins a expansionism, first of all, into um, territories near it, like Puerto Rico and Cuba, uh, and, and then by virtue of having to go to war with Spain, the United States finds itself reaching way out into the Philippines as well, as the Philippines were a Spanish colony. And so uh, President McKinley in um, the late 1890s begins to step out of what was, you know, the Monroe Doctrine, essentially, we're going to hold to our continent as long as the Europeans hold to theirs. And now this is beginning to change and the United States is beginning to undertake its first um, military adventures abroad. And these campaigns we saw are headed towards the Pacific and especially directed at China as this massive potential market. And so all these adventures uh, begin to f form an international American army, a modernized American army, one that's capable of mobilizing uh, troops beyond just the borders of uh, the United States. It also calls for a larger federal national army. As you know, the United States, right up to the Civil War, fought on the militia system. Each state provided troops. Um, there was a federal army, but it was very small. You now have a large federal army as an international um, policy instrument becoming formed. And so we see that uh, by the beginning of the 20th century, the United States has expanded right under uh, the belly of China into the Philippines. It's already since the 1860s um, has been pushing Japan into opening its borders. And of course, Japan is as well a stepping stone into China. The only thing we're going to see what the Americans had not counted on was uh, Japan kind of uh, modernizing in the way China never was able to and becoming a great power itself, which is going to really complicate um, American-Russian relations. So by 1898, um, from, you know, the Philippines to Puerto Rico, uh, 10,000 miles from tip to tip, the United States. And the United States is, is kind of beginning to see itself as a tamer of unruly civilizations. And again, the Philippines are key um, to the American plans for exploiting that mythical Chinese market that everyone is still uh, dreaming about. Uh, you know, how do we get to sell to uh, billions of Chinese customers? It's always been something that the Western countries have been um, pursuing, uh, like the Holy Grail. And all this radicalism now uh, finally um, 
gets to the presidency of the United States. In 1901, um, in response to McKinley's, again, suppression of labor unionism and McKinley's international imperial, imperialistic expansionism, uh, a son of Polish revolutionary refugees, um, George Kolgos, will assassinate the president of the United States, William McKinley in Buffalo in 1901. And that radically, you know, once a president falls to anarchists, that in itself will radicalize the conservative uh, anti-progressive movement in the United States as well. Uh, and, 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 and so now the two kind of poles are beginning to really crystallize. And Theodore Roosevelt now, um, you know, one of Trump's favorite presidents, uh, an expansionist, a American nationalist certainly, comes now to the presidency by virtue of the uh, assassination. And Roosevelt is going to pursue a, a much harder line of international diplomacy, you know, the big stick as as. Roosevelt, um, as Teddy Roosevelt would say, uh, speak softly, but carry a big stick. Again, we're talking about military power. In the meantime, all the great powers, Russia included, and now uh, Japan, which is emerging as a great power. You can see here on the left of the image, the leopard with uh, a sword in its teeth, are all now beginning to fight essentially and, um, well, not physically fight, but uh, become rivals and connive and plot and conspire um, in their ability to divide up China as uh, China begins to fall under various colonial uh, seizures of territory, forced leases, um, and, and essentially China is being dismembered in various ways by the great powers who are uh, essentially taking parts of China like Hong Kong and 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 making those ter territories extraterritorial to Chinese sovereignty. The United States in this gain in China um, is arguing that there should be an open door policy, that no uh, European power or American power hold any kind of exclusive monopoly in any Chinese territory or attempt to negotiate it. However, um, there is a tendency of the United States to kind of hold the keys to the open door uh, policy. So um, the United States is negotiating side deals with other countries for shares in certain territories in China. It's negotiating side deals with uh, China itself in certain territories. Um, and as well, it is uh, now conspiring with Japan uh, itself, a, a former rival, and now they become partners in their attempt um, in the Japanese interest also to expand into China and, and the Americans, uh, since, of course, that, those parts of China are closest, especially to um, Alaska, closest to the United States, the Americans are beginning to uh, partner in some ways with the Japanese in not only their own expansion into China, but the prevention of other powers expanding into China, and that includes uh, the Russians. So here we can see China kind of becomes especially in its um, east northeastern regions in a tight spot between uh, Japan and, and Russia with the United States kind of off stage in a corner manipulating events to, to a great extent. Japan, as I, as I described in previous lectures, since Commodore Perry's arrival in, 19, in 1853, uh, has undergone a radical transformation. It industrializes in record time. Um, 
so that by the end of the 19th century, Japan looks very much uh, like a modern European community. Um, the, the art looks European, the music is very European, the architecture, and, and, and so the Japanese uh, take to European and American technology, the educational system um, with a gusto. However, they still maintain a kind of old cultural warrior uh, traditions and old rivalries left over. And of course, one of the greatest rivalries um, in that region historically has been um, Japan with China. And, and so now Japan sets about consolidating Chinese territories nearest to it. Um, this will uh, result in the first Sino-Japanese War, 1894 to 1895. And this will lead to a vast expansion of uh, Japanese power. Uh, here you can see Japan on, 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 on the map and a few islands that were part of it. Uh, and in here, of course, you can see that this would be the coastal region the, of China that the Japanese would, would um, be interested in controlling. Uh, because, of course, uh, Japan would lie in the path of any naval or navy or vessel coming out of this sea. And, and uh, of course, for the Japanese, um, control of Chinese territory would be essential to begin at, um, you know, opposite to where Japanese territory is. And so um, the first thing that the Japanese begin to do is they invade Korea and they invade Formosa, uh, today's Taiwan, and, and they seize these territories. Uh, Formosa is going to end up being incorporated right into Japan, as will soon Korea. But you can see how the expansion of uh, Japan now and its control of China's access to the Pacific and access to China from the Pacific is suddenly getting sealed in by the Japanese as a result of this war. And of course, at key to this is um, the Japanese seizure of the Light Laotung Peninsula right there, uh, and of Port Arthur, a fortified naval base uh, that um, would lead out into the Yellow Sea right here. This establishes, this conquest of China establishes Japan as um, a power in the Pacific. It uh, reduces uh, the stature of uh, China as well. China was never considered a great power, uh, but certainly Japan is now beginning to approach that kind of status. And again, it, it very much will typify how the Japanese will conduct war for, um, you know, the next 75 years. The uh, Japanese conquest of China is extraordinarily brutal, uh, mass executions, as is as well um, the Japanese conquest of Korea. There, the Japanese uh, massacre any kind of Korean opposition. Korea, of course, had a nationalist movement of its own. Um, it was breaking away from China it, it, it itself, and the Japanese kind of put an end to that, essentially incorporating Korea into Japan. And, and once um, the Chinese are brought to the uh, 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 table to resolve um, this war, and essentially it's going to be resolved in Japan's favor, um, Korea will become part of Japan straight out. Japan will just annex it and will remain a part of Japan until 1945, until the Second World War. Um, the Leitung Peninsula here in the circle, under pressure from the European powers, um, the uh, Japanese are persuaded if they want to 
join the community of world powers uh, to act magnanimously and return the Leitong Peninsula back to the uh, back to the back to China. Um, and of course, uh, here uh, the Russians uh, manage a backdoor treaty now with China, where they end up leasing that uh, peninsula and building at Port Arthur a, a Port Arthur a huge Russian naval base, which really begins to anger the Jap Japanese, considering that they had just fought this war to uh, kind of be able to block any kind of foreign power from the Yellow Sea, and, and, and now the Russians are building a, a warm water base there. Here's what the Leitong Peninsula can look like in, in relationship to uh, China, Manchuria here in the north, and, and, and then Korea, and from the Korea Bay, the exit into the Yellow Sea. So again, you can see what the problem is. Uh, the Yellow Sea is, is, are, are all the warm water ports there at, Le, at, at the Leilong Peninsula. Uh, however, Vladivostok, where the Russian uh, Empire borders at that moment, Siberia, it's a cold, it's, it's, it's still a port that freezes. It's not a warm water port. So the Russians somehow, the only access they can get to the Pacific in, in, in the winter was if they could build a port there and somehow maintain a line of communications between Vladivostok and Port Arthur. And, and, and so Russian plans are essentially um, to lease that territory in the same way the British had, you know, a hundred year lease, if not more, on Hong Kong. And, and so the Russians now are beginning to push into Manchuria. And here they come in conflict, one, with Japan, and two, with American-Japanese cooperation in uh, expansionism in those territories, Manchurian territories of, of, of China. This is essential for a Russian ex ex exit into the Pacific in the winter months. And so now there is a struggle over the building of railways. Um, Russian railway building is partly financed in this period by the United States. Um, at the same time as the United States is fi you know, financing Russian railways, it's also financing um, the Japanese railway that is as a rival driving up Korea and also into uh, Manchuria. And, and this will become, of course, the focus of this huge war that's going to occur between Russia and Japan that essentially is, is, is going to shape our world uh, to this day and, and, of course, will be the beginning of what eventually will become the Russian Revolution. So um, that's a, 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 a quick update for you on um, what we covered previously. And then in the next lecture, you um, can find um, the subsequent history that we did not cover um, in, in our classroom lectures.